Managing storage becomes an increasing challenge as we keep more and more files, folders, photos, databases, and other data. At one time, the megabyte was a common unit of storage. Now it's the gigabyte. Here's a look at some of our options. For a small business, we could store our data on local hard drives that are part of the server hardware itself. One of the earliest drive technologies is IDE, Integrated Drive Electronics, and its faster counterpart, EIDE, or Enhanced Integrated Drive Electronics. In both technologies, the drive controller is integrated into the drive itself instead of a separate controller unit. There were a few variations on this technology, but they all had limitations as far as capacity and number of devices allowed. For most servers, this was soon replaced by SCSI drives, often pronounced as SCSI. SCSI allowed more devices per bus or channel. Now, many variations of SCSI have been introduced, usually resulting in faster and faster throughput. The newest local technology is SATA, or Serial ATA. In addition to faster speeds, SATA allows hot swapping, which is switching out drives while the server is running. There were some variations on SCSI that allowed this, but it's standard with SATA drives. There are other local hard drive technologies, but these three are the ones you'll most likely find in use today. But these are all choices for local storage. There are other options. A popular choice for a small network is a NAS server, or Network Attached Storage. The NAS server usually has no keyboard or monitor, for the most part, it's a cabinet attached to the network with its own NIC holding several hard drives and a stripped-down operating system whose sole purpose is to deliver files to network computers. Sometimes it's called a network appliance. In a larger company, they may choose to have a SAN or storage-attached network. Unlike NAS, a SAN does not have a file system. The SAN typically stores data in blocks and is carved into logical disks called LUNs or logical unit numbers. To the client, the LUN looks like hard disk space and can be formatted with a variety of file systems. SANs store vast amounts of data, so we need to be able to read and write that data quickly. Ordinary network technology may not be efficient enough. We have two high-speed connectivity solutions that are natively recognized by Windows Server, although there are others. The first is called Fiber Channel. As the name implies, this channel typically uses optical fiber, to send data, although it can be used on copper wiring. It can be expensive, as each server connecting to the SAN needs a special network interface called an HBA, or Host Bus Adapter. In addition, there will probably be a network of fiber channel switches, and this network usually has redundant equipment and paths, and is sometimes called a switched fabric. Another alternative uses ordinary Ethernet NICs instead of NBAs. It's called iSCSI, and can send SCSI commands and data over an IP network. No special cabling or switches are needed, although a separate dedicated network is usually created just for this purpose. Most clients connect to the SAN using software called an iSCSI initiator. iSCSI is often considered a low-cost alternative to fiber channel, but there are many factors to consider, such as whether or not you already have an investment in some fiber channel equipment. In the world of Microsoft, NFS is a feature that you can install on your Windows server. This allows you to have a mixed environment of Unix-based and Windows-based operating systems. The Unix clients can access files on the Windows servers, and vice versa. A look at storage would not be complete without a look at RAID technology. RAID is an acronym for Redundant Array of Independent, or originally, Inexpensive Disks. Don't let the acronym fool you, though. The array may be redundant, but the data may not be. It depends on the level of RAID that you choose. A bunch of hard disks are used to make up a RAID array. With hardware RAID, a device called a RAID controller manages the disks. Many personal computer motherboards now offer a built-in RAID controller. With Windows Server, we can also choose software RAID. This means that the RAID array is controlled by the Windows operating system. This has some disadvantages, mainly that it's slower, and the Windows operating system can't be part of the array because it has to be running to access the array. The RAID variations are numbered, such as RAID 1 or RAID 5, and this module will only look at those that are supported by Microsoft. We begin with RAID 0. RAID 0 serves just one purpose, and that's performance. RAID 0 is called striping. The disk subsystem is a performance bottleneck. Striping can improve throughput by writing data to several disks in a stripe instead of waiting for a particular disk to return to a sector. The stripe must be the same size on each disk, in this case, 10 gigabytes. Because we have five disks, the operating system would see this as a 50 gigabyte volume. 
but RAID 0 is for performance only. If any disk fails, we lose all 50 gigabytes of data, so be sure to back up your data. RAID 1 is called mirroring. As data comes in, the same data is written to a set of two drives at the same time. If either disk in a mirrored set stops working or gets corrupted, we're still up and running because the other disk has a complete set of data. This is an expensive solution as we need double the disk space of our data. With RAID 5, striping with parity, we get some read performance benefit from striping and some redundancy. It's not as redundant as mirroring, but it's a less expensive compromise. With RAID 5, we need at least three disks. We can lose any one of the disks and still be up and running. And when we replace the failed disk, we can rebuild the data using information from the other disks. How does this magic work? We don't really need the details for the purpose of this training, so here's a very simplified overview. The secret is in the formula on the left. As data is written to all but one of the disks, the controller does the math on the chart and writes the answer on the remaining disk. This number is called parity, and I've colored it in yellow for you to see. The parity calculation is rotated between the disks. If there were more disks, the math would be a bit more complicated, but the parity would still be written to just one of the disks in the set at a time. Suppose one of the disks stops working. Using the formula, the controller knows what data must have been on the missing disk. When you replace the disk, it can be rebuilt with the missing data. If you want the best of performance and fault tolerance, you want RAID 1.0, sometimes called a stripe of mirrors. RAID 1.0 requires at least four disks because it involves sets of mirrored drives. We get the performance benefit of striping, just like RAID 0, as you see the word data striped across here. But each disk is being mirrored at the same time, like RAID 1. If this were just a RAID 1 stripe set, we could not lose any disk or we'd lose everything. But because of the mirroring in RAID 1.0, we can lose a disk and still have our data. We could theoretically lose four disks in this example, as long as we didn't lose both disks in a single mirror set. If we choose to use the Windows Server operating system to perform software RAID, we do have a few limitations. Because the operating system is controlling the array, you cannot put the Windows Server 2008 operating system on the RAID 0 stripe or a RAID 5 stripe with parity. The operating system will have to be on its own disk. But you can mirror the operating system disk. And you cannot do RAID 1.0 with Windows Server 2008 without actual RAID hardware. Remember that no RAID solution is a substitute for regular backups. Virtual or not, if you want to take advantage of some software RAID features, you will need a dynamic disk. You can change a disk to dynamic, but you cannot change it back without losing your data. A basic disk can be sliced into sections called partitions. On dynamic disks, we usually call these slices volumes, but sometimes Microsoft uses these terms interchangeably. I'm using a tool called Disk Management. I have three basic disks here, one with the operating system, and two empty disks. I will convert the empty disk to dynamic disks so I can try out RAID 1 or mirroring. Now I can put a mirror on these two disks. Notice my other menu choices available to me. And notice the legend at the bottom. This is now called a mirrored volume. If disk 1 failed, I would still have an E drive and my documents would still be accessible. When we looked at server virtualization, we learned that the virtual machine can have one or more virtual hard disks or VHDs. You can use them in other ways besides the virtual machine. For example, if you have Windows 7 Ultimate Edition, you can boot directly from the VHD. If this VHD were stored on a portable drive, you could, in effect, carry your entire computer in a single file. Some backup programs also save the data in a VHD format. You can access this backup by a procedure called mounting the drive. After you mount the drive, you can access the data as if it were another hard drive in your computer. In disk management, we call this attaching a VHD. Notice that the icon for disk 3 turns blue to let you know that this is a VHD and not a real physical disk. One last item to look at is a mount point. A mount point lets me extend a volume to include storage on another volume while keeping the same drive letter. 
I'll extend the space on my C drive on disk 0. Notice the empty folder on my desktop to the left. I'll create a simple volume on disk 1 and make it available as a mount point. It will be accessed from the storage folder on drive C. Watch the storage folder icon on the left. It changes to a portable storage icon. Anything placed in storage will actually be kept on disk 1.